You're listening to episode 98, checking in with Meg and Jess from Friends with Froze. Hello, my friends. I am so happy you're here today. It is December. Is that the craziest thing you've ever heard? Probably not the craziest thing you've ever heard, but I'm just, I am shook. So, I'm so happy to bring you this episode today, changing things up a little bit. This is not going to be a 12-minute talk or a parent interview. We are actually going to be talking with Meg and Jess from Friends with Froze. So if you're wondering who they are, I need you to go back to June of 2020, in which I interviewed them from the first time. They're the podcast hosts of a podcast called Don't Worry About My Hair. And they also happen to be child life specialists and a rec therapist and a nurse. Yes, they both hold dual titles. So today is just an easy conversation to listen to. We hope that you enjoy hearing what's going on with them. Uh, Yes, Jess has some big news to share and that um, I don't want to spoil alert, but yes, it's big news. And we just get to check in with Meg, see what life is like in the urban area that they work in and what's going on in their fields. And anyway, good stuff. So the first thing I would tell you to do is if you haven't, go back and listen to the anti-racism and diversity episode from June of 2020, and then enjoy this conversation. And we will be back next week with your regularly scheduled programming. What about you guys? What's what's going on? Give everybody who listens to Child Life on Call a little what's going on with your life. I'll let you go first since well. you have a more exciting life right now. <laughs> I know. I'm making a human, so I'm pregnant. That's been a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Woo-hoo! Yeah, that's definitely a lifestyle change. I'll tell you that much, okay? Yeah, so, <laughs> for sure. That's been pretty much... The biggest change, which definitely takes a lot out of your life. And I mean, there's not even a kid here yet. So (laughs) it definitely takes a lot of things, just your lifestyle and all of the plans you're making go into a lot of things. So that's been main thing. Megan, anything? (laughs) What you got? You said this was your year of sacrifice, right? Hello, I sacrificed. Hello. Okay. (laughs) Okay. This is my magic year. What I've been up to, still working, still learning, still growing, uh, doing a lot of self-development and reflection. I'm reading more and taking time to do some self-care. So one big thing I'm working on is being more consistent just across the board. So that's something that I'm trying to put into practice. Have not been doing the best job of it, but going to get back on the horse every single day and try again. There Yay. you go. That's awesome. Um, I I very much relate to that. I've kind of, I don't know, I'm sure, obviously, COVID has done a number on all of us mentally and oh. emotionally, but I've like been plummeting lately. So I got myself a therapist and I did nice. my first EMDR last week, which was... I had no idea what to expect. Have y'all ever heard of that before? No, Mm-mm. what is that? I'm going to say it's, <laughs> I keep thinking of like electromagnetic. That's not what it is. It's like rapid <laughs> eye movement from one side of your brain to the other. And you basically process your traumas of your life. And um, the one I did was actually vibrations in my hand. So my therapist just leads me through trauma basically that I've been through And I have these little vibrating things in my hands and I had no idea what to expect, but I could have slept for two days afterwards. Like it was, wow. Um, so anyway, like that was kind of scary because I was hoping I was just going to feel better right after, but that's not really how it works. I kind of felt horrible. Uh, but I guess it takes a while. I feel better now today, like six days out. So Oh my gosh. I've never heard of that. That is very fascinating. Isn't that crazy? The brain is so crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I never heard of that either. What an interesting concept though. I'm you know, I'm going to have to Google this, right? One more time. You are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the other thing that came out of it, which was kind of cool is I've had the most vivid dreams at night. Mm-hmm. And since one was then? since then. And once was a 
they're not at all about what my trauma was about, but it's just, I don't, I don't, I Googled it and it's like, it can unlock part memories that you've suppressed. And so one was a college boyfriend who I really liked and he came back into my dreams the other night and that was cool. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh, so anyway, what about you? Make- pop up if I did that. <laughs> right. Oh my goodness. Suppress memory. Yeah. Crazy. Very interesting. Yeah. No, I haven't done anything as cool as that. I've just been uh, doing a lot of reading. A book that I just started was How to Do the Work by Dr. Nicole LaPera. It's right over here. Ooh, doing the work. Oh, a physical yes. book. Uh-huh. She's a holistic psychologist on Instagram. Oh. If you guys follow her. No, I want to be a holistic psychologist. Right. <laughs> fascinating also gosh guys you guys are filled with nuggets well you're growing a human we have to do something oh my gosh talk about that's another way to have some vivid dreams apparently that's a common thing my dreams have been very vivid and I feel like they're very real I like text my friend I was like we were like walking around the city and it was just so I thought I did that with you I'm calling you to see if that happened yesterday (laughs) (laughs) that's crazy what has COVID and the hospital been like for you guys? Um, you're in kind of like a big city. What's what's going on there with you? And what are your roles in the hospital right now? I know y'all both play the nurse slash rec therapist slash child life specialist role. So where are you? Yeah, I'm still a nurse and I'm tired of wearing masks. Okay. I'm just going to say that out loud. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I feel like a face like this should not be hidden behind a mask, but yeah. no. um that has, as far as for my particular unit, I feel like we're of course doing a lot of COVID testing. Every time a kid has a sniffle, we're running the test. Um, we're still having to do tests before they go to procedures. So that's something frequent. And I work in dialysis. So the kids come every other day for treatment. So it's a chronic population. You see them all the time. So that does sometimes um, concern me because I'm like, oh, is there a greater risk with consistently seeing the same group of people who goes out into whatever community they live in. Um, So they could always be bringing something in to us. Um, I feel like a lot has ramped up with dialysis specifically. We can do use a certain filter for COVID. I personally Mm -hmm. have not had to use it, uh, but I just saw a a piece on 60 Minutes a couple weeks ago about it. And I know that previously they had used it with a couple kids who came in through the hospital. So there's always that kind of like floating in my brain of, hmm, will there be a stronger pull on my unit if there's like an uptick with this Delta variant? Um, and overall, I'm just kind of ugh, about it. I, I mean, I think we all knew that it wasn't going to be over in a couple months, but now that we're past the 18 month mark, it's like, my God, <laughs> when is this going to stop? Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. I think we're just like, I think they've figured out things like I think it's nice because it's kind of like we're still in it but it's not I don't know like it feels like I don't know Megan maybe you can speak to this more on the nursing end like it feels like we're kind of like even with the Delta variant they're like yeah but let's keep going like you know like it's kind of like we're just gonna keep wearing our mask we'll put our goggles back on Mm -hmm. and you know like our our hospital hasn't been doing like a COVID unit anymore, which was like a thing at the beginning. Um, So now it's like a a patient with COVID could be anywhere. So it's, it's kind of like a little bit more nerve wracking because it's like now we're all just like hyper vigilant. But um, I think more interesting, it's been like, uh, we've been dealing with, I think the refugees from Afghanistan more here. Wow. which has been a very new thing for us now. Um, and just because Philadelphia is one of the safe hubs that the cargo planes are flying into with the refugees from Afghanistan. So there have been chop docks that are there and then triaging patients right to us. So that's wow. been definitely interesting and an eye opener. Just, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about like cultural awareness and like, like a question, I just, we, we had a conversation with someone who was born and raised in Afghanistan and now works around the city. And she, you know, someone asked like, what's appropriate to bring in? Like, what's not like, what's culturally insensitive. And she was like, 
honestly, these kids learn to play never. Like they start working at the age of five. So if you're wondering, like, should I bring in an iPad or like Play-Doh or are these like not appropriate? She's like, you could bring in one crayon and a piece of paper and these kids will go crazy. Like just like re reflecting on like how we get those kids who are like, no, I need Legos. Like, you know, like, Mm -hmm. and how these kids are that we're getting in from worlds away being torn apart from their families is just like, you know, and, and now we're thinking like, okay, not just COVID, like these kids don't have vaccinations from everything. Like a lot Mm -hmm. of American things that we just take for granted, like chicken pox or anything, like just like a whole different world. And like, you know, you bring them one thing and it's like, oh my gosh, I could play with this for years, you know? So it was just like an interesting, it's definitely been an interesting flip, flip of the script of like, holy crap. like, they've also been dealing with COVID in a different way and also a war and like all these Mm -hmm. other things. And now we're here. So it's, I think that's definitely been like a moment to like pause and be like, holy crap, like what, you know, why do we do this? What are we doing? And like, really just reflect on like, how my, like child life specialists, how we are like here, like even like the, the modern medicine of nursing, like in our not third world country and like how crazy it is to offer that to these people that literally were just like ripped out of their homes. So that's definitely been, I think a big recent thing, like within the last month. Yeah. I feel so removed from that. Just being down here. I'm in Austin, Texas. We just don't have any of that coming to our hospital. I, what has it been like for you? Like I can only imagine like emotionally seeing kids or people die of COVID has been really hard for me. So I work in a children's hospital and an adult hospital. So I'm working with, um, the parents who are dying of COVID and helping their spouses explain it to their kids. And so that's been like the most emotionally challenging part for me. So I can't imagine then having to also now be empathetic and a supporter and an advocate for these families who have gone through Warside, but that's been hard on you, especially pregnant. It probably feels crazy. Yeah. I don't know how people do it child life and pregnant. I mean, I guess we're all doing it or we've done it once or something, but I think it's definitely been interesting. And like, I fortunately haven't had to work. I worked a couple days in the ED this cause you know, holidays. Um, so it was labor day and I had to work in the ED and there was just so much between like, you know, COVID thoughts and like, you know, kids coming in and then like simultaneously remembering how to support kid, like, you know, I'm like, oh yeah, kid's going for an extra, I got this. And they're like, no, you don't. Like, you know, like, and then also this other crisis going on. Like, it's like just things that I think where we work, we're like unit based and like, we just forget so much. Like you said, like you're in a different area, but like, there's just so much to being in our role that I think we get so siloed sometimes that we forget like there's people doing our jobs and like like your role yourself like I'm not doing that at all like you know I don't interface with adults in that fashion at all like my patients are on a rehab unit and the parents are just like coping with new function like Mm -hmm. of their kids so like you know kind of I think sometimes hearing what every and seeing like in that moment those those holidays like I was like holy crap these ED girls (laughs) Like I, you know, give it to them. And like, we just sometimes don't know. Like, I think we just sometimes don't know what each other is doing. And it's kind of like, just like in Austin, Texas, in your program, it's like, you know, maybe it's not these major hospitals, but like, or I'm not doing that. I probably wouldn't be able to emotionally do that right now. And like, just thinking about how, I don't think we give each other enough grace. Like, I think as a, as a role in general, we're always like, oh, child life, like we do so much. But I think even just each other, like, I think we all come home and we're like, oh, my day was so hard. And that's validated, like valid, but also thinking like, holy crap. Like, you know, sometimes I think we're like, oh, I wish I worked in a small program. I wish I worked on a different unit. I wish I worked with a different population. I wish I could like, you know, like, I think, I don't know. It's just, I think it's been more reflective um, to just think about how much we actually do when there's certain limitations or certain challenges to our role whether it's me being pregnant or 
me working in a major city. Like, mm. I think I've just been very reflective lately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that's a question I have for you is like, we've all experienced a lot and each one of our experiences are so unique. How do you guys process things that are hard for you? Like, what is your go-to? Cause I think I used to go to not processing, but kind of procrastinating. Like, I just don't think about it. I just go listen to my audio book about world war two, <laughs> or I just go yeah. <laughs> like, you know, play with my kids. It's like, I just don't pretend that what I went through, just, I didn't see it. It didn't happen. And that's not the best way to do it. So how do you guys process hard things that you go through? Such a great question. I am similar to you. I, I find myself using escape as a coping tool. So I will come home and be dog tired. And a lot of the kids I work with have complex social situations. So there's like always kind of battling through that. And um, yeah, so I'll just come home and watch Real Housewives and <laughs> eat something, <laughs> take a shower, go to sleep, get up, do it all over again. But I realized like, man, that really is not serving me. Yeah, And it was causing me a lot of issues at work because I would come in in the morning and already be mad. And I mean mad, and that's not typical for me. Um, So I could see some changes in myself and I was like, "Mm." but again, (laughs) with escapism being my coping tool, I was like, yeah, these changes are bad and I don't like feeling mad, but I'm just going to be mad and then go home and watch TV again. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And so I was kind of going through that cycle. Um, But yeah, more recently, like very recently, last few weeks, I'm trying to be really intentional was like, okay, you can watch a little bit of TV, but then you actually need to do something that serves you. Even if you don't want to do it in the moment, think about the long term. So for me, walking home works well. I can, I feel like I can regulate with a consistent pace of walking. I can listen to music or not listen to music. Sometimes I like to walk home silently. Um, And then reading has been a more recent outlet as well. Uh, journaling too has been helping. Even if I don't want to talk about the things of the particular day, just be, uh, doing a little bit of a gratitude journal has been helpful as well. So just kind of forcing myself to do that because I'm realizing that my pattern ain't working. I know. Mm-hmm. It kind of feels like homework in a way. And you're like, I just don't want to do it. Like I've already had to deal with all of this. I don't want to do anything yes. more. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But I'm like, uh, that's how you graduate to the next level is doing your homework. <laughs> exactly oh dang you're right oh yeah and I can't stay at this level currently I'm failing so (laughs) you need to need my a plus you level level up up. immediately oh I think I'm having to like repeat kinder a few times (laughs) right now with where I'm at Go back to the basics, honey, but get it done. So thinking, um, I'm so interested, Jess, and hearing a little bit more about like the cultural considerations of these families coming from Afghanistan. What has been some of the big takeaways from their culture that you feel like was unexpected that you didn't really anticipate? Um, I think one of the major things which has probably come up in the past is just their religion and their faith is so different than where are we eastern are we western where are we in west we're west okay we're western because i was like that's so you don't know anyway so (laughs) west the earth is round (laughs) yeah like we're gonna just keep going round like anywho um like it's just so so different than like westernized cultural like majority um religion and just thinking about how much we aren't I don't know necessarily catering is the word, but considering their faith and their religion and what may be needed. And also that everybody's not this, just like here, everybody's not the same religion, like there, everybody's not. So don't like, I think just thinking about how um, that could be interpreted and also just, I think really the biggest takeaways was just like how much, because we get, we get international families all of the time like that's very common but a lot of the international families that come to us are pretty middle class like considering where they're coming from over there like it's not like these are very the people that are coming are very very not middle class like very much 
destitute or like coming with nothing or coming separate from families. And I think that's been the biggest takeaway of like just the privileges that we have. And um, I think that's just been the biggest, like just how much is can be taken away and like they are just taken out. They are just taken out of their home and their life. And now are here, which is wonderful, much more safe. But like, what does that really mean? Like you can be safe and have no clue what your next step is, you know, like, right. And these are kids, right. Like, you know, some of them are still separated from their families. They're still trying to find their families. Um, and like, you know, they're in a safe place and we, you know, I think there's that like savior mentality. Like we saved them. We brought them to here and got them out of that war torn area. But it's like, yes, we did. And like took them away from everything they've ever known, their food, their, their clothing, like they're out of a comfort zone and into a comfortable place, quote, unquote, like, you know, like, it's just, it's just amazing to think like, you know, it's like going into a hospital, we take a kid into a hospital. And that's why we exist, because this is an unfamiliar territory, even though we're telling them, like, you're safe here, we're here to care for you. But that doesn't mean that it's guaranteed that they are supposed to automatically feel safe. That's why they have child life, right? To help with coping. Like you don't get a child life or a cope a therapist immediately when you land here into this new world. Like I think it's just a crazy, remarkable, weird mm. thing. Like, you know, it's like wonderful. Like you said, they're getting this help, they're getting this life. But I just feel like it's such a we're only with them for a short time, you know, what's their life going to look like after they leave the hospital and then what? And we're so like out then. Yeah. So it's reminding me so much about like the, the Texas border and what's Mm -hmm. been happening. um, Yeah. And how significant that, that is. And just like you said, like they're here, they're on this side of the U S border, but they're without their parents. They're sleeping with foil blankets. It just, it's, it's not what it should be. No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Yeah. It's it's a a lot at one time. Yeah. Like what, and like, what should it be? Cause like, I think, uh, I've, I've adopted this mentality that like, no one does anything out of malicious intent. We just all don't know anything. Like we don't know any better. We don't know what we don't know. And like, I think, of course we all have the best intentions. Like we weren't bringing them here to be like, get you out of your home. But like, I think it's like, we're, we're thinking so immediate or like, like you said, like, what are we supposed to do at those like moments when we're like, we, we want you here in safety at these like borders. And like, and we, we just think it's safe here, you know, but what is safe can be so subjective. Like, what does that mean to anybody? Like someone might've felt safe in their home, even though not right. realizing how dangerous it might have been or just or th- that danger was just their normal, you know? Yeah. So it's just so hard. Yeah. And kids yeah. can't really understand uh, that this is like the best case for them, right? All Absolutely. they know is they were ripped away from what, everything they knew. Absolutely. And nothing's ever going to be the same. We'll be right back. Incentives work. They work in healthcare and they work with kids. Think about it. If hospitals provide free rides to patients, they show up on time for their doctor's appointments. Teachers use incentives to encourage academic achievement. Hope for Henry unites these truths to ignite the power of incentives to help pediatric patients do the things they need to do to get better. It works every day at hospitals around the country. Child life specialists are trained to use this program, and they're reporting that 58% of their patients don't need sedation for certain procedures, and 95% of their patients are using super rewards and having an overall improved patient experience. Kids at hospitals like the Cleveland Clinic, Inova Children's Hospital, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, and so many more are feeling more cooperative, less anxious, and having a better patient experience because of super rewards, a state-of-the-art incentive program. To learn more about Hope for Henry, check out their website at www.hopeforhenry.org and bring super rewards to your hospital. Follow Hope for Henry and contact them through social media at Hope for Henry. One of the big takeaways I had from our conversation last June, so if you're listening to this podcast, you need to go back and start Um, I think it was June, 2020, and we were discussing specifically like anti-racism in the field of child life and kind of exploded over to the healthcare field in general. But my biggest takeaway from that was just what you said, Jess, and being willing to say like, I don't know, but asking the questions and learning a lot. And I feel 
very much called to do that as far as now that we're talking about these um, Afghan families, like we just need to ask questions like, how can we help? How can we be a refuge? How can we gather material? How can we respect their culture? Um, mm-hmm. And we need to be doing that for everybody we come in contact with. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I'm wondering, I so I don't have any personal experience with working with Afghan families yet in the hospital, but I was on a different unit and I was in the bathroom <laughs> and I saw posted up a resource guide of like how to interact with these families in the bathroom. And I was like, wow, like I'm so grateful that somebody developed that and put that up. And I'm sure it got disseminated throughout the hospital. I probably just didn't catch it um, when it, when it was disseminated throughout the hospital. So I was really grateful for that. And it's having me wonder, yeah, I wonder if these resources are out there for every hospital. If not, I'm wondering if there's people on teams who are willing to do that work, to be able to put that information out there or let people know that they are a safe place to too. Because honestly, without it, I don't know what I would have done if I would have encountered a family. I probably would have had to Google, but it was nice to know that there was an in-house person who helped develop this. Um, We work in a very large hospital. So I'm sure there was a, a few people who are interested in developing that. But for our smaller hospitals, I'm wondering what is out there and available. Mm. Yeah. Um, I bet Child Life Disaster Relief has been coming up with some great materials and they always kind of are at the forefront of that. So that's childlifedisasterrelief.org. And I know they're always looking for volunteers. Um, So I guess in the year plus, we I think we did really good. We're only like a year, June, July, August, September, what, like 15 months, three months past our due date of wanting to talk. But what changes have you guys seen in your hospital, I guess, since we talked last time, like specifically about Black families in healthcare? Have you guys seen anything change? Have you kind of like there was a lot of talking about it at the beginning and now it's kind of died down? And, you know, that's kind of what I've been seeing in my hospital. I think initially a lot of changes were made. People were talking about it a lot and maybe it's gotten a little bit better, but. I don't know that we're at the level. I know we're not at the level we need to be at yet. Yeah, I think yeah. a change. And you want to talk about the hair stuff, Jess? Uh, yeah, uh, I think, I mean, this. we have fortunately had a, oh yeah. So our hospital did a rollout of like BIPOC, like hair products. So black indigenous people of color, like um, products that could be more supportive to those hair textures so like different yeah so like and they're available in our um med supply chain so like you could call down to the med supply room um like the main room any any unit throughout the hospital and can request um specific like combs conditioner um hair moisturizer uh bonnets like different supplies to support patients that, that have black hair texture specifically but also I mean it caters to I think I think that was one of the biggest things was like yes this does cater to black black folks hair but also other people are reaping the benefits as well like with you know there are white like white girls with thicker curly hair that this is actually they need a wide tooth comb and this is great like you know so I think that was one of the best things was like you know when you make these changes for one group that needs it, like, it's definitely going to support all, like, you know, Spanish Mm -hmm. cultures. And I know Megan has brought up, like, there's tons of other, like, cultures that have thicker hair that need these um, products. So that's definitely been a big one. And I definitely know our Black families, at least on my unit, have been able to say, like, oh, that's great that you have that um, to offer um, versus us having those families go out or bring something in from home. Yeah. So that was like something that was kind of starting, but then it like ramped up with the Black Lives Matter movement and more conversation. And now it's available to all. So that's, that's wonderful. Amazing. It's such yeah. a, it, it seems small, but mm-hmm. I'm sure it took a, actually a lot of coordination and a lot of yeah. legwork and people staying at it to make sure that it did happen and got rolled out and, and stayed that way. For sure. Oh, yeah. We have a multicultural professionals network that does a lot of work as well. So they were like extremely active when um, 
the Black Lives Matter movement was going on. And they've stayed consistent with offering education, guest speakers, et cetera, for people to have open and free access to. They just have to log into the whatever video chat service we're using. Um, we also have like this monthly rounds, which is like more psychosocial that talks about challenging topics. And some of them I have seen have been directly related to that. So that's also available for people. I do feel like I have noticed some drop off specifically in certain groups, but I'm hoping that um, as time moves on that people are at least more open-minded to hearing about it. So whenever these things are offered, um, people will be interested to tune in to them. And a city as Black as ours, Philadelphia is what, I want to say 50% Black, uh, it's necessary, yeah. absolutely necessary. And we're working service jobs, interacting with dozens or hundreds of people daily. We need to have that knowledge and we need to have a place to be able to express uh, opinions, questions, interesting things, challenging things, whatever. Uh, so I, I think our hospital is doing a, a decent job of making sure that that's offered. Um, I don't know the stats on how often people are tuning into these, but I hope it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah I good. definitely think people have been more willing to talk. Like, I think that's definitely been, I mean, like you said, like whether, you know, participation has dropped off. I think, I don't know, like you said, I don't know the stats, but I think there've been more willingness to host the conversations and willingness yes. to engage in them. Like, I definitely feel that even within the units I work on, um, people have been more open if the conversation comes up like, hey, I think something not super fair is happening here with this patient mm -hmm. and family. And I just need to mm -hmm. talk it out. Like been willing to talk about that or just been willing to listen when people say like, even if you find like one safe person or one, per like I've, I've felt that there's been more, I don't know if buying is the word, but more willingness to understand and be like accepting that like, that can be a perspective and I can listen and understand more because I don't know that perspective, mm -hmm. um, at least as a black clinician and being able to say like, Hey, something seems a little off here. I'm just going to say from my own perspective, I don't know what everybody else is thinking. And then being able to reflect together versus me going to like my black colleagues and saying, I'm just so pissed that this is happening. And like, you know, still might be doing that, but like also <laughs> kind of to, to like have that conversation and not feel like it's shut down and like, no, it's not a thing. That's not a thing. Like, I feel like people have been less likely to say, no, that's not a thing. Like, no, we're not being racist. No, we're not being discriminatory and being like, okay, wait, yeah, let's take a second. Like, I think that's happened a bit more than I've ever seen this last year, even if we're not actively making any policy changes or things like that. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I would wholeheartedly agree with that. Yeah. Well, that's huge. I mean, it's it's not enough, but it's huge. And, you know, in my hospital specifically, it's it's kind of cool. We have these two polar opposite hospitals. I have at a very small children's hospital and then a larger adult hospital. Um, so as far as like making committees and stuff, we don't really have that. But one thing, and so this is of my own fault, like, so if you, when y'all put like an NG tube or an IV in a doll, like there's these dolls mm -hmm. called water babies, which just tend to be the easiest ones to use because they're kind of squishy, but they're not plush and you can clean them. And we've just always had these like white baby dolls and that's what was easiest to find and was usually donated. And actually like it was just so dumb and ignorant to not to think that that was good enough. And it just isn't. So we've got our bag of multicultural dolls now that we have that all have the NG tube now. So it looks like, you know, like the quince package when you're like carrying around, there's like five little babies, super cute. <laughs> but also just being aware of the books that we're giving out to families and make sure they're a representative of more than just white people doing white people things. And that they look at different cultures all the way around. So, um, and I would agree. I would think people are feeling more brave to have tough conversations and asking questions and bringing things to the forefront. Yeah. And that, that is another thing. Our department actually just uh, got, I think each unit got 20 plus books. We were able to get 
20 plus books with no, basically not, no white people in the books. Like they were all children's <laughs> books from board books to like um, smaller chapter books to like just kid books about so many different cultures and like everybody, I mean, you know, again, very highly resourced. So like to add that in, but it was just something that one day they just popped up and like one of our like coping committees was like on this task force to, and this was part of what they did. And like, they, I think we just got them, I guess about a month or two ago and it's like a giant stack. And like, so we have them in our playroom and it's so funny to think about just having that option and like how the different responses from kids are going to grab whatever, right? Like kids are going to grab the brown baby because they like brown babies, regardless of their race. I mean, because they like babies, not because it's specifically brown babies, but like right. you want to play with the doll, you're going to grab the doll that's there. And like, same with books, like the book looks good. I'm going to grab it. And I think the bigger response has been the families, like the parents being like, oh my gosh, that, you know, this book looks like our family or that baby that that girl has is she's just walking around with, you know, a brown baby doll and our family's brown. And like, you know, like, I think just like it, it comes more from the parents that are like reflective of the stuff we have because kids are going to be kids regardless, right? Like they yeah. don't, they don't know until they know. So I think that's definitely been like, a, I just think of that because one of our kids was like grabbing books for like bedtime after one of our groups. And his mom was like, oh my gosh, this, this family is wearing like headdresses, like, you know, like us. And I was like, yeah, it's one of our new books. She was like, that's amazing. And like, you know, the kid just grabbed the book. Like he looked through and I mean, maybe he subconsciously was like, that family looks like mine. I'm going to grab it. Yeah. Grabbed it, gave it to his mom, said, I'm going to the bed now. Like, let's go. Like, you know, <laughs> no reflection. Of course, he's like six. Um, and it really like seemed to touch the mom. Like, you know, yeah. that's, where'd you get this book? Like, I've never seen this book, you know, like this is amazing. And, you know, I think it, it has a more profound effect on the adults um, when we're just thinking about those toys, because it's going to be subconscious to the kid yeah. for right now. It's like, I think about that, that feeling of wanting to feel safe. And we want parents to feel safe in hospitals too, even when they're not the patient. And when you feel like you're represented, like you're seen, like you're accepted, mm -hmm. like that makes you feel safer. And overall, that would make me feel better about being in that hospital. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Yeah. I will say, I, I feel like I was a little um, used to the hospital we, wor we work at having so many resources, like Jess said, but looking back, I'm like, yeah, I've been to visit other playrooms before and uh, not as resourced and definitely not as diverse. And Jess and I did a, we did two speeches last year, one around this time for the greater New York area child life conference. And then we did one for um, the, oh my gosh, Association of Child Life Professionals. Um, <laughs> And so we, in both of them, we, t we discussed diversifying your playroom and how important that is. Um, really providing those books, those toys. And you're right, a lot of donations that are coming in are just going to be white babies, white Barbies, et cetera. They're very easily accessible. You can find them easily. Where sometimes in some areas, finding a black Barbie might be a little bit more difficult or mm -hmm. finding an Asian baby might be a little more difficult. But we were suggesting to a lot of programs, even if you're small, if you're requesting donations, whether it's through your website or you got flyers around town, I don't know how people do it these days, but <laughs> requesting multicultural toys, books um, to get into your playroom. That way, if you have a tight budget, you still might be able to get some of these things from the community into your playroom. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Especially because holiday season is coming up and people are going to be doing sure that is. stuff. Yeah. Um, and then I also, just as we're talking about books and diversity, um, I got to interview last year, this wonderful woman named Mija and we talked about her daughter, but she owns the company Jumbo Books and it's like a book subscription. So uh, every month I get three books based on my child's age and interest level and they're representative of all cultures everything from um there's one called Laxmi's Mooch and it talks about um a little girl who's Hispanic and has a little mustache and what that feels like for her and to you know it's just so many different things that I never would have thought or bought for myself so highly recommend right. jumbobooks.com <laughs> I really love it yeah, that sounds awesome 
That does. That's funny. A little mustache. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was like, guilty. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, well, thank you all so much for chatting with me. I know it's late there. All right. Thanks. Bye, guys. <laughs> Good night, Bye. ladies. Thank you for listening to the Child Life On Call podcast. I'm your host, Katie Taylor, and you can follow us at Child Life On Call on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please rate and review to make it easier for other families to find us. We have cute merch available at www.bonfire.com slash store slash Child Life On Call. And you can listen to more episodes and find resources at childlifepodcast.com.